Excuse me, folks. This is uh, Brother Ben Henson. Uh, stand in for Brother Blake Nagy. He couldn't be here tonight, so we actually stand in for him. So uh, you got me. Before I get into the message, I'd like to ask those folks out there that, uh, that have a prayer life and actually pray to uh, remember Brother Blake and to remember an unspoken request I have concerning him. So I appreciate it. I know he appreciate it. Uh, I'm sure he covets your prayers. And I uh, ask you to remember that. So I'm going to get right into the message. I'm going to start the reading in the book of uh, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, and verse 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 16, the Bible says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. Uh, the part of the, uh, the scripture I just read that I want to concentrate on is right there, that first line of verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? I'm thinking about generations tonight, and... Um, you know, how one generation passes to the next and uh, how they affect uh, the generations that follow. Uh, as I get into the beginning of this message, I'm going to do a little brief history lesson on a generation past. Uh, I'm going to start out uh, with the two Supreme Court decisions that were made. This was made in the early 60s, actually in 1962, June 25th, 1962, and another one that was made on June 17th, 1963. Uh, these two Supreme Court decisions that happened uh, at this point in time uh, managed to take uh, Bible and God out of schools. It happened there in 1962. Uh, that's when that happened. Two years after that, in 1965, the rock band, uh, The Who, that was their name, came out with a song called My Generation. Uh, 1965, if you do a little bit of studying, it's a thing, I, I guess, in this day and age, uh, to name generations, to assign letters to them. Uh, so 1965 uh, began or ushered in uh, what's now known as Generation X. Uh, that began again in 1965. Uh, I, I guess the Who, the rock band The Who, was uh, given that uh, that honor, if you want to call it that, of, uh, of bringing that song out called My Generation. It kicked this whole Generation X off. Now, I want to look at some things that uh, that came out of this generation to start with. And again, I know this is, uh, to some folks, ancient history. It's almost 50 years ago. But it's pertinent to the message. And, and as, as we get down through the message, maybe you'll be able to see why I'm going through this. Um, the Bible says that uh, by their fruits you shall know them. That's in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20. We want to look at some fruits here right from the start that came out of this generation X. Of course, uh, anybody that knows any history at all knows that the 60s were... Uh, the love period, uh, that's when you had the hippies come out there and the music and all this. Uh, they called it free love. Uh, as I was studying for the message, I also found the phrase new morality. Uh, so you had free love. Uh, all that is, folks, is another way or, or a nicer way of saying sexual relations uh, without the benefit of marriage. You saw that all through the 60s uh, with these kids, these teenage kids and, and 20-something kids. Uh, just sleeping around uh, like animals, no commitment, no uh, boundaries, uh, no uh, value on anything, just living like animals. Uh, that came about in this generation X. Call it free love. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing free on this world except uh, salvation that comes through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's what they called it, free love. Uh, they called it the sexual revolution. Uh, it's just having sex with no uh, no boundaries, no concept of love, uh, although they uh, put love in their term for it, uh, love had nothing to do with it. Just living like animals. Um, again, in the generation next there in the 60s, you had rampant drug use. Prior to this, uh, there was drug use. People always used drugs, no doubt, but prior to this, the drug scene and the drug crowd was primarily uh, jazz musicians and stuff like that, but uh, during the 60s in this generation X uh, that came about, uh, you had mainstream drug use, had LSD, acid. Uh, these kids were taking this stuff to expand their mind, uh, to create their own reality, or perhaps escape the reality that they were in. Um, smoke marijuana, heroin came to be in the mainstream at this point in time. Uh, mushrooms, I mean, I guess if they couldn't find nothing else, they'd eat a mushroom to try to fry their brain. Uh, just trying to escape reality. Uh, during this generation, you had the flag burning. 
people burning, burning their draft cards, uh, no love for country, no honor, uh, no loyalty to God, uh, no nationality. You've seen that uh, come about at that same time during this Generation X. Um, school shootings. You had the Texas University Tower shooting there in 1966. A man by the name of Charles Whitman climbed the tower there, and I think he killed 18 people. Uh, that came about during this generation. Uh, you had the Kent State shooting there at Kent State University in Ohio in 1970. I think there were four people killed there. Uh, that's some fruit that was bored by this Generation X. Uh, again, you had Studio 54 that came out. It opened in 1977. Uh, I tried to do some studying on this studio. I went on the Internet and looked, but I'm telling you folks, the pictures, I just couldn't hardly, couldn't hardly stand to look at them. This Studio 54 that came about during this generation uh, was a haven, a refuge for homosexuality, bisexuals, transvestites, pedophiles, people practicing bestiality, I mean, any other act of perversion that you could think of. And yeah, I did say perversion because that's what it is. It's perverse, folks. It's perverse. Uh, now, that's not my opinion. That's not my thoughts. That's what God says about it. Uh, homosexuality was a sin and an abomination to God before the law in the Bible, during the law, and after the law. God hadn't changed his stance on that one bit. Uh, and you had this Studio 54 that came about there at the end of Generation X, and it's a place where they went and practiced all kinds of perverse, corrupt things. They gloried in it, uh, gloried in the fact that they were doing it, and it was a safe haven for them. Now, that place closed down in 1980, uh, but it didn't matter. The damage was already done to the generations that followed. Perverse. That's what it is, folks. It's perversion. But the crowning jewel of Generation X came about in 1973. That's the Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade, which legalized abortion. Now, if you talk to anybody uh, that's not saved, that lived through this generation, they think it was a great generation. Uh, people discovered themselves. And, uh, I, I, there's all kinds of... of, of of ways they describe this generation about how good it was, but I'm, I'm looking at it from a Bible standpoint, folks. I'm a preacher of the Word of God, and I'm to give the counsel of God, and I'm to preach the whole book of God, and I'm to call these things out. And if you look at the fruit that was born during this generation, according, and you, and you weigh it against what the, the Word of God says, a terrible generation, awful generation. Again, that generation ran from 1965 to 1981. Now, I was born during this generation. I was born in 1967, so I was a baby during the biggest part of this. And so I, I actually lived some of it and saw some of the goings on. Um, you say, you know, why bring up this past? I, there's a reason, there's a point to bring this up. I know it was 40 years ago, um, but nevertheless, I bring it up because according to conventional wisdom, uh, if you listen to the smart people in the world in this day and age, the intellectuals, uh, we're supposed to be evolving. We're supposed to be getting better. We're supposed to be making the world a better place and, and getting better all the time. Uh, according to the smart people, folks, we're three generations down the road now from this Generation X. Uh, we went through Generation Y, Generation Z, and now Generation Alpha. Uh, so according to their way of thinking, we ought to be pretty much near perfection. If you've got half a brain in your mind, uh, you can look around at what's going on this day and age and realize uh, that things ain't perfect. And we ain't evolving, we're devolving. The world's getting worse, folks. The fruit that was born during this generation. It makes me wonder about uh, that scripture in the Bible as I'm standing here. I can't tell you chapter and verse, but it, uh, the Bible says something about the Lord visiting the iniquity of the fathers under the third and fourth generation under those children. I think we see that happening. We ain't getting better, we're getting worse, folks. Think about the generation in which we live now. Uh, this generation alpha, they call it. Living in such a time when that sexual revolution that was started back there in the 60s has turned into a sexual pandemic. Uh, and I did say pandemic. Uh, sexual pandemic something you ought to worry about, not the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we see in this day and age, uh, if you do a study on it, and I actually looked this up, uh, they say that uh, we're getting better because divorce rates this day and age are lower than they've ever been. And they say, well, that's great. We're progressing. We're moving forward. But the truth of the matter is, folks, uh, divorce rates are lower because people ain't bothered to get married anymore. People are just like the 60s, except it's progressed and gotten worse. People ain't doing the honorable thing. They're not following Scripture. Uh, young men and young women ain't waiting and practicing abstinence till they're married, doing it the way the Lord would have you to do it. Uh, the reason the divorce rates are so low is because nobody ain't getting married anymore. 
They ain't bothering with it. Uh, what they're doing is shacking up. They call it hooking up, I think, in this day and age is what it's called. Without the benefit of marriage. Just sleeping here, there, and everywhere. Again, just like animals. We're bearing the fruit of teaching this evolution in our schools. You teach a kid that he comes from animals long enough, he's going to act like one. And we see that here. This revolution, it's turned into a pandemic. I looked at a study online as well, that, uh, and this just astounded me. The stats say that uh, with children, teenagers, from 15 and younger anymore, 50% of them are sexually active. Now, folks, that ought to be an abomination. 15 years and below. And there are 50% of them are sexually active. You're going to tell me we're evolving? You're going to tell me that what the fathers and the mothers and generations past do don't affect their children? You're going to think that you can get away from what this Bible says, that it will be visited? You think you can get away from reaping what's been sown? And we see that today. 50% of these kids from 15 years and younger are sexually active. You know what the stats say when you look this up? They say, well, it's okay. It's all right because teen pregnancies are lower than they've ever been. <laughs> you know why they're lower than they've ever been? It ain't because kids are, are doing the honorable thing and following the Word of God and trying to have some, some temperance and self-control. The pregnancy rate is lower because these kids now, after they've shacked up and hooked up, can run down to the health department or run over to the, to the Walgreens and buy over-the-counter Plan B abortion pills without the benefit of even having to have their parents with them. The judgment's taken away, folks. It's taken away. They've taken away the consequences, the fear, the judgment on sin. They've taken it all away so these kids can be just like those kids from the 60s. No consequences, no fear, no boundaries. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I can do what I want. I'm my own God. I can follow my own star. They tried to take that away, but there is a reckoning. Make no mistake about it. The plan B. We're living in a generation now, back in the 60s in that generation X, they passed that, those bills there to get God and to kick him out of the schools and his book out of the schools. Now we've progressed to a point where they're not just happy having him kicked out of schools and the Bible out of the schools. Now they, 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 they'll never rest until they've got God kicked out of our homes, kicked out of his own church, and ultimately kicked out of this country and if he'll take those of us that believe him and his book with him, that'd just be even that much better. That's where we're at today, folks. That's where we're at. <laughs> they don't want us to go with him. I'll tell you, if you're like me, sometimes I get discouraged and I, I get disheartened about these things. And, that, and that's really the point of the message now. I'm just going to tell you right here to start, it's already 15 after 8. And I'm out of practice on preaching this broadcast. I only get 30 minutes. I've got way more notes. Uh, then I have time. But I'm going to keep preaching until I run out of time. And wherever I'm at in the message is wherever I'm at in the message. Now, uh, the point. Of what, what point are you trying to make by bringing all this up? Well, here's the point, guys. Uh, you look at Generation X or Generation Alpha, where we're at now. It's the same spirit behind what's happening. We may think we've got it bad. We may think that we're the worst. Uh, as, as a Bible-believing Christian, I may want to have the temptation to feel like I'm I'm burdened or saddled with something that my mother and father weren't saddled with. But the truth of the matter is, it's the same God of this world. And there is a God of this world according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The God of this world is Satan. And every sin comes through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It's the same thing, folks. Regardless of the generation that we're in. Here's the truth of it. The world's going to be the world. And Satan's going to be Satan. And lost people's going to act like lost people. Regardless of what generation you're in. Uh, it's, it's nothing new. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, you see Moses there talking to his generation. He calls them crooked and perverse. Deuteronomy was written in 1450 B.C. If you go to the Gospels, you'll find the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels were written between 30 and 60 A.D. And you'll find him calling them old crooked and perverse generation. Ain't nothing new that we're having to go through. But it feels like it sometimes. The point is again, that all these things that are happening, this dealings with with the pressure to conform to this world and the society to change our way of thinking, ain't nothing new. Those that have come before us have had to go through the same thing. So we ask, what are we to do? What are we supposed to do? Well, I asked the Lord, I said, give me a verse, Lord, to work and to use in this message here tonight. And the verse he gave me was Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Great cloud of witnesses. What great cloud of witnesses is Paul talking about here? That great cloud of witnesses is contained in the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, most people will call the heroes of the faith chapter. I've called it the faith chapter myself. It is a record of faith. It defines faith, explains faith, and gives examples of faith. But Hebrews chapter 11 is also, folks, a, a historical account of generations of people, God's people, generations of them from Adam all the way up through Paul's time, and generations of people who, who endured the same spirit of the age that we're having to endure, they had to endure the same persecutions, the same discouragements, the same fight. And this Hebrews chapter 11 gives a record of them and what they accomplished through faith. They remained steadfast. It's a history of a generations of people that God called out of their own specific time and in their generation whom he used for his purpose, his honor and his glory. And they were faithful to do so. It's a good record to look at. Good example for us in this day and age to to look at and to draw from, uh, to get our strength from, to see what we're supposed to do. That's really what I uh, am trying to preach tonight on what are we going to do and how do we do this, what do we do. We don't do nothing new or different, folks. We stand. We can take example from these folks here in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, if you read that chapter right quick, they subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness. This is God's testimony of them. Um, they stopped the mouths of lions, out of weakness were made strong. They endured cruel mockings, tortures with stones, sawn asunder. All these things, Lord, now, uh, I me and you, we ain't resisted unto blood yet. It may come to that. And so if we get to feeling sorry for ourselves about the time, the generation in which we live, we need to think about that. Not a one of us that I know, nobody I know, have resisted unto blood. It may come to it, but we ain't happened yet. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, the Bible says these things were written for an example. For our admonition. Now, these things being, of course, the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 11. So, according to Hebrews chapter 11 and 1 Corinthians 10, we don't have to wonder about what we need to do in this generation in which we live. We can know. We can look at what these witnesses did uh, during their time and their generation on this earth. So, in light of this, I got to hurry. I'm being pressed for time. In light of this, I'm going to try to give three examples. I'm going to give an example for man, I'm going to give an example for a woman. And if time allows, an example for a child. So the first example I'm going to give, this is well known. Uh, I think everybody's taught this story right in Bible school, uh, vacation Bible school. I, I first heard this story. I was probably about four years old. But I'm going to use Noah. Now, I'm going to use Noah because if you look at it in light of what Hebrews 11 says about him, but also in the time in which he lived. You think about Noah's time there. It's in Genesis chapter 6. And this is when the sons of God came down. And they made it with the daughters of men, and they produced a race of supermen. Now you think about that. We think we've got it bad. Noah was living in a time when fallen angels had made it with women and produced superhuman men, giants. The Bible says it's like the Incredible Hulk and Xanos from the from the Avengers movies. Uh, Superman, Iron Man. That's the kind of people that Noah had to live around, and these weren't uh, these weren't saved people. You get me? Uh, these, these these beings that were created. Uh, were being driven by the spirit of Satan that was in them. And the Bible says in, there in Genesis chapter 6 that uh, God saw that the wickedness of man was great. Every imagination of his heart was evil. I don't think we're quite at that point yet. That's a testimony of every man. Every man on the earth at that time in Noah's time and his generation. Every thought he had. There was no good thought in his mind. Every thought was evil only continually. Every man but one man. That's the point I want to make tonight, folks. Every man but one man. I know Genesis chapter 6, 6, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. But the verse that really caught me as I was reading this, and I I know I've read it before, but like so many people, when you read your Bible, you skip past things. It really stood out to me when I was studying this. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, there towards the end of the verse, the Lord gives a testimony of Noah. It ought to stick, especially in light of, of my context, what I'm preaching about. God said, For thee... Have I seen righteous before me in this generation? That's Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. That's a testimony that God makes. That, that line just really stood out to me. Noah was, was seen righteous in his generation. 
his generation. Now, prior to that, in Genesis 6, again, uh, the, you know, every man, according to the Word of God, every man, his thought was evil. But one man, folks, one man, one man that will take a stand can make all the difference in the world. God gave this testimony of Noah after the flood. Now, everybody knows the story of Noah. He built an ark. <laughs> but you think about this. The Bible doesn't say this. So, but I'm not going to take liberties with the Word of God. And it really doesn't say this, but you think about this. In Noah's time, it had never rained before. There was no rain. And God tells Noah, I want you to build me an ark. We know what an ark is, a big boat. It never rained before. And Noah worked on this ark, folks, for over a 100 years. And according to Second Peter, I believe it's Second Peter, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. One man, one man, who listened to what God said, who obeyed what God said, not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word, can make a difference. Noah showed up for work for a hundred years, working on this ark. And again, the Bible doesn't say this, but knowing people like I know people, I guarantee you that all these supermen, all these evil men gathered around him every day. I imagine it was quite a show. Probably sold tickets so they could make fun of Noah, call him all kinds of names, call him a Bible thumper, call him a homophobe, a racist, a bigot. And yet he showed up for work. Now there's a testimony for us men out there. It's a testimony. He showed up for work, folks. Now you can say, well, the flood came and drowned everybody else. Just Noah and his family got saved. There it is, folks. There it is. You understand out there, men tonight, you save men out there, you Bible believers, how important it is for your family, for you to be steadfast, to stand, to take a stand, and to make a stand for the Word of God. You say, well, what difference does it make? It makes a difference for your family. In Hebrews chapter 11, the, the Bible says, So Noah prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah's household got saved because of what he did. That's a responsibility. So, what a responsibility. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 10 and verse 12, the Bible says, Be of good courage, and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> you show up for work, men. Noah worked for a hundred years solid, every day, day after day after day after day, a preacher of righteousness. He didn't conform to this world. He didn't transform into their way of thinking. He didn't let them change him. He showed up. God said, I want you to build me an ark. And he worked on the ark for a hundred years. And he had his family work on the ark. And in the end, he saved his family. One man. One man in his generation. If nothing else comes of it, men were to provide for our family. The Bible says, if any man provide not for his own, especially they of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Be the man. Play the man for our people. That's our responsibility. God first and your family second. We're to be lights and witnesses. We're to be steadfast. We're to be men. We're to be God's men. And to take a stand, folks. <laughs> Let us play the men. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it ain't in vain if all it does is lead your family in the right direction and see them saved out of this whole mess that we're in, out of this generation. You've done what the Lord wanted you to do. One man can make a difference. Stand against this spirit in this generation. I've got five minutes left. I'm going to try to run through an example for the women. And then I'd say that'll have it for me. Boy, I really messed up on the time. If Brother Blake's listening, Brother, I'm sorry for making a mess of it. Uh, example for women. Now, there's two books named after women in the Bible. One's Esther and the other's Ruth. Most people will use Ruth. Uh, and she is a picture of that virtuous woman there in Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 31 through the end of the, of the chapter. Well, I'm going to use Esther tonight because there's a, there's a, a key salient verse in the book that I want you ladies to get. And I hope I've got enough time to get there. But the book of Esther, if, you, if you're a Bible student, you know a little bit about Esther. I'm going to try to hit the high spots because I'm really trying to hurry here. But Esther, the book of Esther takes place during the captivity uh, when Israel was carried away captive unto Babylon. And Esther was carried away with her first cousin Mordecai who raised her. Uh, so, Right from the start, uh, she's got a bad start here, folks. This woman is, is basically a prisoner of war. She's a homebound slave. Uh, she's serving under a government that doesn't know the Lord and could care less about him. 
Kind of sounds like our time and our generation, doesn't it? But through the providence and grace of God, just like Noah, uh, the Lord allows her and puts her in a position in front of this king, Ahasuerus. Uh, and he does that for a purpose and for a plan. Uh, she learns consequently through this place that she's been put in that there's a man named Haman uh, who has uh, uh, plotted to kill the Jews, uh, to put them to death. He's deceitful and he's brought about this plan. And she learns of it. And her first cousin Mordecai learns of it. And he sends word uh, to Esther. He said, now, uh, Esther, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go in under the king. I want you to, to make supplication for us. And he said, for who knoweth whether thou hast been raised up for such a time as this. Uh, you ladies out there that, uh, that, that have a family and your church goers, your Bible believers, I want you to get a hold of that verse right there. Lay it to heart. Uh, Esther here. And Mordecai looked at her and said, who knows? But maybe you've been raised up at this point in time for such a time as this. And what does Esther do? Esther says, well, Mordecai, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray and I want you to fast. She's a praying woman. You know, I, it's, it's, it's odd to me as I sit in church a lot of times and they get prayer requests. I don't know if it's like this at your church or even if you've paid attention, but it seems like at my church that there's more women that request prayer than there are men. You see that here with Esther. Uh, she said, Mordecai, pray and fast. And she said, I'm going to go and do likewise. I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast. And I'm going to go in under this king and make this request for my people, for my family. And if I perish, I perish. What a testimony. You ladies out there uh, that have families, you've got children, uh, and we're having to live in this mess that we're living in, this generation uh, where anything goes and there's no boundaries, there's no God, no Bible, uh, just whatever uh, comes is whatever. This is, a, it, this is an excellent example for you women. Uh, you've been put here, ladies, for such a time as this. You're a Bible believer. Uh, be like Esther. Esther gave no thought to her life. If you read Proverbs chapter 10, verse 31, through the end of that chapter, that virtuous woman there that it's, that it's talking about, that woman is selfless. She's sacrificing. Ain't no thought for herself at all. It's all about her family, her husband, her children, and her family. Esther's like this. Ladies, you want to make an impact in this world and in your family, just like Noah saved his household, and you be like Esther, and you put yourself to death. Let it be about God, about your family. And about truth, according to Deuteronomy chapter 34, I believe it is, it says, teach your children. That's what you're to do. You are to guide the house. Younger women are supposed to marry and guide the house. That's your job. You teach your children the Word of God. You teach them the difference between right and wrong, that there is no gray areas in it. I don't care what these liberal Democrats say. I don't care what their teachers say. I don't care what the professors say. There's black and there's white, and there ain't no gray. And it's going to be up to you, ladies, because your husband, if he's worth anything, and a godly man is going to be working. So it's up to you to teach your children and to open this book. It's up to you for them to see you praying and reading this book and teaching them right from wrong. And you stand. You take a stand. You dress yourself in modest apparel which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Be a help me unto your husband. Now, I, like I said, I've got way more notes. Uh, Brother Gary, I've messed this message all up. I had more notes than I got time. I wanted to give three examples, a man, woman, and child, and I've just had to skip over. But here's the thing, folks. I'm going to give you this scripture, and then I'm going to get out of Brother Gary's way. Uh, the child I was going to use, of course, was Josiah there in second. Chronicles, but I, I, I'm going to give you this scripture here. I know I've run through these verses as quick as I could, folks. Uh, but here's the thing. If you don't get nothing else out of the message tonight, uh, as a Bible believer, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Continue in these things. Continue in the book, folks. Husbands, fathers, children, Bible believers, saved people. Don't you cow to to these people out here that's bullying us. Don't you give in and be conformed to this world. I don't care how hard they make it on you, you take a stand. Have some backbone about you. Have some boldness and stand up for the Lord. Stand on this book. Continue in these things in which we've learned, folks. Why? First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is the Lord talking to us now. But ye are a chosen generation and a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Folks, there's what we're to be doing in this generation, this time in which we live. We're a chosen generation. 
God has chosen us. This is our time. If you could bring back these folks from Hebrews chapter 11, Esther and Noah and say, well, well, what are we supposed to do? They look at us and say, this ain't our time. We've run our race. We've finished our course. This is your time. This is our time, folks. This is our generation to do something for the Lord. I believe it's the last generation before he comes. I started Matthew. Where in two shall I liken this generation? Wouldn't it be good to get to the judgment seat of Christ and kind of hear what the Lord said to Noah? For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. It'd be a good testimony to get there and hear that. To be one man or one woman or one child that stood up in all this mess that we're in now and said that sin is still sin. Adultery is still adultery. Homosexuality is wrong. Abortion is wrong. All this corrupt perverseness that's going on, it's all wrong. And I'm against it. And I'm for God. This is Brother Ben Henson. Until next time, may the Lord bless you. And good night.